y'all hey mom all the moms representing tonight both carl's mom and my mom kathleen and any of the rest of the moms who haven't commented you are also welcome (laughs) moms make the world go round as as the as the beyonce song goes um (laughs) is that that actually the way the Beyonce song goes no. Oh. <laughs> it's girls. Girls well, run, run the world. Back but in my hiatus. Yeah. Zach's yeah, in a new house. Breather. Zach, tell us all place. about your new dwelling. It's kind of like a tree house. I live basically in the back parking lot of Quack's Bakery. So if anyone's going to Quack's and wants to pop by, say hello. Can't. And uh, it's great. It's a little, it's, a, it's small, but it's uh, perfect for, for me. My girlfriend Katie just moved in, so she's over there. And then I have a new uh, a gentleman by the name of Milo, my uh, cat, who also moved in. Oh, we um, need to meet Milo, Zach. We need to see Milo. He's a little bit. Uh, oh, is it tricky? I don't, think, I don't think he'd be. Well, he's chilling really hard, and I just feel bad. One second, let me grab him. <laughs> Very necessary. The gentleman of the feline variety. Oh, James says, I reorganized the garage. Yeah, I was actually inspired by our mutual boss, Graham Reynolds, who, uh, you know, as soon as the quarantine started, he was like, he was going to, you know, he rearranged his whole studio to to be very one-person oriented, so I did the same thing here. Sorry for disturbing your slumbers. Zach, do you have an Otis to the Milo? Uh, no. Otis. Maybe he'll maybe he'll befriend like a rat. Oh. And uh. Well, I was thinking every time I say it, it reminds me of that uh, the turn of the screw, which is uh, terrifying. Which is the 
positively Benjamin Britten opera that's like a really terrifying. scary ghost opera. But also the opera that um, we didn't, none of us got to play in it, but we were at the summer. That's where Invoke met and played for the first time was at a summer festival where they were playing Turn of the Screw. And I remember having a bottle of wine and watching that opera with y'all. That was, it was a really creepy part that goes, Milo, Milo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Obviously, we know our music, but only obscure pieces. There's Actually, Turn of the Screw isn't that obscure. Turn of the Screw, yeah. It may be obscure to our audience. It's weird. There's, like, dead kids in it and stuff. Ugh. Yikes. Well, they're not, they're not actually dead. They're technically undead. I think they're making a, a movie, Turn of the Screw movie. Are they making a out. turn movie? Not, not a musical, but just the story <laughs> of that. Oh, like without any of Britain's music? No, I think it's just the, the, the play. Yeah. That they, to they totally are. Well, interesting. Anyway, welcome to Invoke in Pieces. <laughs> What's the slogan? Uh, What's the slogan today, uh, Jeff? Where we have the most uh, delectable drizzles of of musical selections. I don't know. Okay, well, you have to come. I'm out. I'm out on that one. I'm out. Another D word. Delectable drizzles of. No, we don't need another D word there. Decorative, dainty. Delights, delight. Yeah. Delights. Yes. Well, delectable and delight. Are kind of that's the same. True. I'm, playing I'm just seeing the person with the shovel digging deeper into that one. <laughs> not... I've I've been in the grave like since I started this, so like whatever. How low can you go, Jeff? That's the question. Exactly. Like maybe I'll maybe I'll get to the other side of the planet at some point. James says, "Ew, I concur." <laughs> Very. I'm playing a piece like by somehow. a composer with the first name Dorothy. So. Oh. That's a go. D. It's a D word. Uh, anyway, let's play music before uh, we hurt ourselves. <laughs> before people so, leave. who's first? It's Carl, right? It is me, and this uh, Invoke in Pieces is brought to you by the letter D. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> so, I am actually, I am. At, oh, hey, Brad, how's it going? I am actually broadcasting from State College. Haley and I are up here seeing her mom and her brother for about a month, actually, which is kind of crazy. It's a long time, but you know, time means time is meaningless in quarantine. Um, and I've been instructed to show everyone Max, who is going to be my performance buddy. There he is. Maxie. Good boy. Dogs are here as well. They're having a great time. Cora's outside with the fam. Um, we have a little bit of an audience out there, and by that I mean Haley and her brother and <laughs> Um And also uh, Brad and, or, uh, Barb and Tim, and we know Barb. You guys know Barb. They're out there hanging. Um, so yeah, the piece I'm going to play uh, today is called Sonoran Storm. It's by uh, Nukufua Mugenyama, uh, and I apologize, apologize if I mispronounced that. Uh, she's fantastic, and I actually have to thank Jeff. Hats off to Jeff for introducing me to this piece. He, in his search for uh, solo cello music, found uh, by um, you know by composers of people of color, found uh, several viola pieces and sent them my way. <laughs> so thus saving me a lot of time. Um, but yeah, this piece is super cool. It's called Sonoran Storm. Uh, and I kind of want to just read what she wrote on the title page of the piece before I hop into it. Uh, and she, by the way, is a violist herself. Um, and she, I believe, won the Primrose competition at some point. Jeff for me. And I heard her recording of this piece, and it was really intimidating because I was like, oh boy, I have to perform this in a week. <laughs> but anyways, I'm going to read this. This is called Sonoran Storm by uh, Nobufula uh, Wagenyama. Humidity rises in the desert. That scorched blaster hitting the face feels fuller and expectant upon exit. Haboob dust causes a metal gate to clang, its bulging brown outside. Feet scamper across parched earth as clouds approach. Expanding into the atmosphere, they amass to quench aridity's obsession. Anti-trades carry ocean moisture across Baja California to the Sierra Madres during the monsoons. It drifts north across El Camino del Diablo and swirls above the Mongolian rim. Cumulus giants made stronger by El Nino dwarf the eastern landscape. The sun sets, the ground cools, and the desert braces for thermal dy dynamicism. Tree branches partner with updrafts while downdrafts pelt the land. Angular veins shoot through the darkness. 
Thunder rubbles an abusive baritone's vigor, while the saguaro leads succulents in thirsty supplication, arms towards the sky. Static tendrils demand audience. Jagged voltage communicates melody in joyful abyssence. The Virga stop teasing as ten miles of heaven drop to the floor. Big Weather enjoys a snail-paced game of bumper cars, reforming whilst arboreal cards stand empty. It's calm. Is it over? Abated leaves bathe in temporary starlight. But summer westerlies do not relent, and another thunderhead descends. The romp resumes, culminating in a celebration of renewal and life. Thank you. 
space, yes? All right. Awesome. Hey, Steve. <laughs> hey, Sharon. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Nicely done. Nicely done. Sounds just like the weather. Yeah, it's really awesome. And if you, uh, um, I might be able to throw the link up, but if you haven't heard her performance of this, it's fantastic. It's on YouTube. I think it was part of the Red Rocks Music Festival, uh, but it's her playing this solo. She also, she has a really cool viola quintet for anyone interested in playing that. I know if Mendy's here, I'm not sure if she's here tonight. Um, but the viola quintet, I think she premiered it with Dover. It's super cool. Yeah, um, that was another one that I found. I think also that same piece she has... I'm not sure which one came first, but Snore and Storm exists as a viola concertino also, like with full orchestra and like harp and shit. Yeah. Or, you know, yep. it's crazy. Percussion and um, it, it it's interesting to kind of hear that in comparison to the solo version and what she chose to keep and what she chose to highlight and stuff. I'm getting I'm getting props from the deck. They say it sounded good on the deck. <laughs> <laughs> Having a live audience for once that aren't um, canine through a window, but yeah, you know. <laughs> the soundproof uh, window. Well, kind of. <laughs> um, luckily, there's a screen. Uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was fun. It's kind of, it's kind of a workout. Um, it's yeah, definitely a, it's definitely an exercise in your fifths and fourths, and my viola started going out of tune about halfway through. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> oh, man. I, uh, it sounded hard enough. Like when I found it, I was like, "Oh, this is cool. Maybe I could arrange it." And then I had two thoughts at the same time. One of which was, "This is too hard for that. There's too many octaves." And also, um, <laughs> I know if I were a violist, I would not appreciate anyone who had enough rep to play stealing their rep because they don't have that much. You all have a wealth of riches, Jeff. You cellists have no right to take our uh, hard hurts. I might do it anyway, but <laughs> I'm going to, well, if you do that, I'm going to poach those solo cello pieces. You just hey, watch. Man, okay. Whatever. We'll just have like a lot of recycling going on in these streams. Oh, I was supposed to plug this too. So I'm drinking this awesome Imperial Stout from Voodoo Brewery here in State College. This is called Black is Beautiful. It's really good. It's got cocoa hints. It's it's a very standard Imperial Stout, but very delicious at the same time. So normally I do Austin beers. Today it is a State College beer. Nice. Still local to you. Local to me currently, yes. That's great. Awesome. Well, I think I'll pass it off on that note. Uh, thanks for listening, guys. This is Invoke in Pieces, where all the members of Invoke play solo rep um, due to uh, social quarantining uh, measures. <laughs> Not because we want to at all. I mean, that's just... Especially now, like, again, like, Texas is nutso right now. It's like it is. 10,000 cases. Bad, bad times yeah. down here. I'll tell you yeah. what. Nick, you're, uh, Nick you're, off the, you're on the mute, or maybe you're not muted. I just someone want to talk briefly about how we're doing donations today as well. I was going to do it, but I, I don't want to keep using up all the time. <laughs> That's all right, man. Go for it. You're up next, Jeff. You can leave with it. <laughs> I can lead. All right. So we've, um, we've been very happy to support the Austin Justice Coalition with our donations. Um, and we're, we're in the process of discussing what the future of what that's going to look like is. Uh, but at the very least today, we're going to be giving half of what we get, 50%, uh, to the Austin Justice Coalition. And of course, the other half will be used by us to continue this content, um, you know, putting food on our tables and, and allowing us to buy sheet music like the stuff that we're playing tonight um, to continue this coming every week and delivering the, the good stuff, the delightful drizzles, as I said before because I'm going to dig myself deeper uh, to your computer doorstep. Um, yeah. All right. So I am going to switch over to better sound, I think. And I'll double check from Nick to make sure this is all working. All right. How's that? Thumbs up has been achieved. So I throw the headphones upon the floor. Um, <clears throat> gonna lead with 
more whiskey times. Um, and the floor actually reminds me, for those of you who uh, <laughs> are fans of Richard Patterson, this will be old news to you. But Richard Patterson is a character. He is the head master blender uh, for White and Mackay out in Scotland, um, kind of overseeing the, the blends and the product lines for the Dalmore Scotch, Verdura, and a few others. Um, and he's been doing it for decades, and he's quite a character. He has a specific way that he wants you to hold. You have to be using the right glass to taste the whiskey. You have to uh, pour some in the glass, swirl it around, and then throw it away. Like, not the glass, but throw the whiskey in the glass. He says, put it on the carpet. And to me, that's wasteful, but I think it's both a marketing ploy for being quirky, but also at the same time achieving his goal of removing any impurities from the glass that you're using so that you can nose the whiskey and only the whiskey. There's nothing else in there to mar the experience. Um, I'm not gonna do that, but he's a funny guy and definitely check him out on YouTube, Richard Patterson. He's, he's very quirky and um, <laughs> he's, he's, he's fun to watch. Uh, Anyway, I am going to have a little bit of a late celebration. I think, uh, well, I know, I remember that a few streams ago was my birthday. And I was grateful to the guys for celebrating, playing a little ditty for me. And I had a bottle of scotch coming that was the same age as I was turning. Uh, but it hadn't arrived yet, and it finally arrived this week. So I'm going to pour some of that and enjoy it and talk a little bit about it. Um, let me grab it now. So here is the bottle itself. Hopefully you can get a decent view of that. It is a 1992 distilled Ben Riach, um, bottled by the independent bottler, Karen Moore, or however you say that, in Gaelic and part of the limited celebration of the cask series bottled at natural cask strength and for those of you who know whiskey you know that generally whiskey uh well it has to by law be at least 40 percent by alcohol uh, alcohol by volume abv or 80 proof if you're in the u.s um but cask strength can go can vary widely it can be down as low as 40 uh, but because of the different variables involved in aging, it can be a lot higher or still pretty low towards 40, even if it's cast strength. In this case, this bottle is pretty low. It's 41.6, um, which to me means that it was a barrel that was kept relatively low in the warehouses, because usually warehouses that have many, many layers of barrels aging, um, the top ones, the alcohol to water evaporation ratio is different. So they tend to get higher in proof over time. Um, whereas lower bottles, sometimes the water can drip down into them and, and lower the proof. Um, it's a lot of reasons for that. But anyway, here we are. Stilled in 92, bottled on January 28th of 2019. So just shy of 27 years actually. And so let's have a nose. I was able to try this the other day. It was, this is my second experience with this. Um, it's a pretty tasty whiskey. I mean, it's got a lot of classic Highland space side notes, a lot of light fruits. Um, it's pretty sweet, actually. It's a lot of kind of honey sweetness in this. Um, definitely because it's so old, 26 years, uh, it, it's had a lot of time to mellow and there's a lot of, um, interestingly, there's not like so many layers, like finding flavors, you know, that you may not have expected, or at least not yet, because it's still, I only opened it a few days ago, but it's a fantastic um, kind of roundness and sweetness and would be great as a dessert whiskey. It's just really well done. So I'm happy with that. Um, Cheers, Steve. Lots of comments have come in. 
All right. Feels birthday, man. Why is your name green? <laughs> Our comments view is actually a little different. Um, so it's, I'm getting used to it. Anyway, the music, because that's also why I'm here. So I have been very lucky, actually, in the past week. I've been working pretty hard to track down solo cello music by people of color. And um, Carl's girlfriend, Haley, uh, notified me of a <laughs> Instagram post that was very, ended up being very helpful. So thank you, Haley. Um, uh, I can't remember, I should look this up. Arlen, I should give her, give the credit where it's due. Uh, I will refresh this page. Um, and while it loads, anyway, it was just like a, a slideshow of some works for solo cello by people of color. And then in the comments, there were more suggestions. And I looked through all of them and tried to listen to all of them. And even though uh, some of the music may not have been exactly my taste, I was happy that they were there and being shared um, and a good handful of them uh, I was interested in tracking down scores for, for this. So, all right, Cello Arlen, I think, is the Instagram handle of that post from a few days back. And, um, yeah, so one of those pieces that I found from this um, treasure trove is the Baroque Suite for Solo Cello, Unaccompanied Cello, by Dorothy Rudd Moore. And Miss Moore is uh, still living. She was born, I believe, in 1940. Um, and she's done a lot of cool work. She studied at um, Howard University, and then she went over to France and spent a few years with Nadia Boulanger um, and has done some awesome stuff. She's taught at NYU, um, Harlem School for the Arts. And I'm excited to play this piece. She wrote it, uh, again, this is the Baroque Suite for Solo Cello for her husband. Um, she did some concertizing with him as a piano cello duo, uh, but this she wrote for him in, I believe, let me double check, 1965 um, for, for her husband to play. And I'm gonna be playing the second movement first to end with the first movement because um, it ends a little bit better. The second movement, um, it's interesting that the Baroque-ness of it kind of comes out <clears throat> in it being tonal music uh, with a little bit of the, the 20th century um, kind of harmonic, kind of messing with things harmonically. It's not fully tonal, not Baroque, certainly. Um, and most notable, these two movements are both in five. Uh, the second movement is in five, four, so and it's a molto adagio, so it's very slow. And sometimes the hypermeter works out. You can't always tell that it's in five, but I think it's really well done. Um, a, a nice slow piece in E minor. So again, this is the second movement of Dorothy Rudd Moore's Baroque Suite for solo cello.
Oh. Certainly some heavy stuff in there. All right. Uh, one more, though. One more piece of music. I see all my colleagues jumping up and getting ready to do stuff. So fake you all out. <laughs> all right. Going to switch over. I actually um, spent a bunch of time transcribing this because the score that I got is handwritten. And this first movement uh, combined with it being just slightly difficult to read <laughs> was in a weird cleft the whole time. So I changed some things around. So I'm changing my score. And here we are for the first movement. But before that, I wanted to share another quality beverage I have in front of me. Not a whiskey this time. I actually uh, have a bunch of other things in addition to my whiskey stores. And this is a rum. And I was talking about cast strength before, even though my other bottle wasn't all that high proof. This is more high proof. This is 114, 57%. What is called Navy strength rum which apparently comes from the fact that alcohol reserves to the sailors on the ships would need uh, or would test the rum rations that they got for how strong they were by seeing if it would ignite with gunpowder, I think. Um, and if it was below a certain proof, then they know they were getting gypped out of their booze because it was getting watered down. Uh, so this is, I think that's where the term Navy strength comes from. This is bottled by Old Line Distillery in Baltimore, Maryland. I got it on the on site there back when we were still, uh, you know, living there and able to travel. <laughs> um, and Old Line, of course, comes from the fact that Maryland uh, can be known as the Old Line State, referring to the Mason-Dixon line. And this actually was not distilled or even aged by uh, Old Line in Baltimore. It was distilled and aged in the Dominican Republic um, for seven years, Caribbean rum, and they just uh, liked it and bottled it in Maryland. So thank you to the Dominicans who put their work into this. It is very sweet. It is, uh, yeah, it's pretty good, but it's also pretty hot on the booze, so that's why I'm having it on the rocks here. And that is, uh, very delicious, would be great in a hurricane, the cocktail that is. Um, I probably will be trying to get my tiki drink game up because some of those things are delicious and I miss a particular bar in Austin by the name of Small Victory that does tiki drinks wonderfully. So any of you working there or watching this, hats off to you, I hope you're healthy. Um, but back to Miss Moore. And the first movement of the Baroque Suite, this again is in five, but in five eight this time instead of five four. A little bit happier, uh, kind of jaunty, very much um, more kind of reminiscent of what you would think of Baroque music on solo cello would sound like. So let's get into it. This is the first movement of Dorothy Rod Moore's Baroque Suite. Thank you. 
Definitely be playing the third movement of that at some point later. But that was the first two movements. Dorothy Rudmore, thank you for your work. And uh, let me get back on the headphones with the peoples. The peoples approve. The peoples dug it. The peoples liked it. Much appreciated. It was quite good when, wait when was that piece written uh 65 65 we're spanning the range yeah and all, all, all sorts of timelines i actually don't the, know when the my chevalier piece was, was the 1700s right yeah actually don't know exactly when this one was written but i, I well i just found it this morning so <laughs> this morning <laughs> and you're worse than me well, I had other plans, but then they turned dark, and then I realized I'll have to like rethink that. But that will be my story. I'll tell that later. But yeah. I'll... So, uh, but but because you said that, anybody uh, watched season three of Dark yet? Because that stuff's real good. I'm still working through season one. Oh man, you you y'all need to work on that. I'm still working it's... through knowing what you're talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lifelong endeavor. It's a quality Netflix original. Show. I think it's the first Netflix original in German language. Shot, Ooh, conceived, so. directed, acted, all by German people. Um, oh, I yeah, have heard of that. It's really well done. Time travel. I heard the typical NPR story. Crazy stuff. It's kind of mind-blowing. you got to have your, your own wall of people with faces and, like, A chart. and charts and stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty nuts. It helped to, you know, not watch it alone. Not because I mean there are some scary parts because it certainly has a has a creep factor, but but uh, it helps to like have somebody else who's like oh yeah you know you remember that person because we saw them here and like here's how they connect and like, uh. creep factor is part of the appeal. It's important. <laughs> oh sure yeah. Gotta yeah. have it. It's named dark. Anyway, watched in original German with English English subtitles because yeah, it's better that way. Anyway, way. welcome to Invoking Pieces. Thank you everybody. Also, Maryland is not that bad, Brad. Ew, Maryland, come on. <laughs> but Maryland. thanks, everyone. So, guys, I gotta, I'm gotta. i going to hop off and watch the stream with the fam over here. But to Steve and Brad and everyone else on, peace. And I will, uh, I'll talk to these gents in a bit. Bye, guys. These Cheers. gents. See you, Carl. And then there were three. Dun, dun, dun. And we've always been talking about firing him anyway. Oof. Uh oh, he's still here. Say that aloud? He's still in here. <gasps> Maybe you heard it. <laughs> anyway, that's that's like an oh, inside I'm joke next. by now. Dang, I have to play now. Well, I did yeah, figure out when my piece is. So, wait, does this mean I'm backwards? Do I look no, backwards to you? Well, at least on right. Zoom. Yeah. I'm but not sure. I think no, on Zoom it's right, but on the stream you're backwards. Yeah. Oh, weird. Why is that? Is my, I wonder if I can flip that. Let's see. 
Uh, Are you doing something new? Because it used to be that your camera could only work in one spot, but it seems to be working in both Zoom well, and OBS. I'm trying a new thing. I'm trying just, uh, just doing, like, having my video in Zoom so y'all can see me, and then just streaming the video from Zoom. But it's um, backwards. I wonder if, okay, y'all are going to get, I'll be looking under the hood here for I, a second. Mirror my video. There we I, go. Done. Okay. I, uh... I see on Zach's stream the what I see on Zoom. I see Zach on stream, but of me, I see opposite of what I can see myself. Interesting. So now, yeah, now what? Wait, no, that's right. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you're, if you're, whatever. If the passageway to the kitchen is is to the viewer's right, then strange. That will get. Yeah, I guess what, it's what also to my today? right. Nick. Uh, I am doing a piece by Carlos Simon, and let me jump into it here, and I'll pull, drop my video up here, pin that, do that, do that, and we're here. Wait, are we? No. There we go. That's better. No. I want you to go away. Perfect. Okay. So I'm doing a piece called Between Worlds by a composer named Carlos Simon. And I, it's actually, it took me, well, I discovered this composer a long time ago through like a random thing. So some of y'all know I work part-time for a film composer, and I've always been super into uh, film music and all of that. So um, I discovered this film scoring competition through a now defunct um, uh, film society essentially and one of the years that I entered that this guy Carlos Simon won this was like five years ago or something um, so I found him then and I like I liked the thing that he submitted but I never really like super looked into his work since then um, but recently I kind of rediscovered him uh, he, through a uh, video he did actually he played at the kennedy center in dc on the millennium stage which we've also played it's a if you're not familiar the kennedy center is the big performing arts center in dc and they have this series called the millennium stage series it's free concerts that they have basically in there i mean it, it's the hallway but you know it's a huge ceiling and they have a stage at either end and um and they have free concerts there i believe almost every day if not every day of the year uh, and you can just go and show up and watch whoever. So uh, we played one It was actually like, I think a couple days before we left to come here uh, about four years ago. And then uh, he played one, I think it was last year or something like that. And I happened across that and I was like, oh, this guy seems familiar. So I like looked him up and I was like, oh yeah, he did that film scoring thing. And then I was digging through his stuff and he's got a lot of really interesting um, classical uh, classical stuff. Uh, he's, you know, he does film scoring and, and media composition and stuff like that. Uh, but he also has these really interesting pieces, um, a few string quartets and a couple other things. And this solo piece called Between Worlds. And I'm going to read his description first and then uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, person who inspired this piece. So um, the piece is called Between Worlds. And uh, here's the program note by Carlos Simon. So Bill Trailer was born a slave in Alabama in 1853 and died in 1949. He lived long enough to see the United States of America go through many social and political changes. He was an eyewitness to the Civil War, Emancipation, uh, Reconstruction, Jim Crow segregation, and the Great Migration. As a self-taught visual artist, his work reflects two separate worlds rural and urban, black and white, old and new. In many ways, the simplified forms in Trailer's artwork tell the complexity of his world, creativity, and inspiring bid for self-definition in a dehumanizing, segregated culture. This piece is inspired by the evocative nature as a whole and not just one piece by Trailer. Themes of mystical folklore, race, and religion pervade Trailer's work. I imagine these solo pieces as a musical study, hopefully showing Trailer's life between disparate worlds. So he references uh, these solo pieces. There's a version for violin, and then I think, I'm on his site right here, I think there's also a version for 
cello and a version for double bass. So, um, and that they're all slightly different. Uh, this is the violin version, obviously. And Bill Trailer, I you know I looked more up on him, and he's kind of recently um, become a little bit more well known. I mean, obviously he's still very. I didn't know of him before reading about this piece, but he's a really interesting composer or composer artist, and um, one of the the more interesting things that I noticed about him um, was that, you know, he was born into slavery in the 1850s, um, and he didn't actually start being an artist until he was in his 80s. Uh, He ended up in Montgomery, Alabama, um, and he started drawing basically at the age, the, let's see, what year was it? 1939. Yeah, so, um, he was in his 80s, became an artist, and um, just cranked out a whole ton of really interesting artwork. And I have here somewhere a picture of him and some of his work. So I'm just going to put it over my face here for a second. Um, so that's him there, and then that's one of his pieces. And um, a lot of his pieces are in this in a similar style. Some of them have color. Some of them are just drawings, uh, and just really interesting stuff. And a, a pretty um, like the composer, like Carlos Simon mentioned, uh, a really kind of all over the place life. He took them all over the the country, and obviously through a ton of different um, experiences in you know one of the most formative. Uh, periods of American history. So uh, that's Bill Trailer. I'm going to put uh, um, Carlos Simon, uh, his website here in the in the chat. If you're interested in learning his his solo stuff is also really interesting. He's he's um, a jazz pianist, and he recently came out with a new uh, album. Did that go through? I don't think it did. I'll just put it in here. But so like the stuff he did at the Kennedy Center is um, is like his jazz, uh, a little jazz combo. But this is a little bit more of a, it's got jazz and blues influence for sure, but uh, solo violin piece. So I'm going to stop running my mouth and play it.
short one, but a good one. I'm going to switch back to my speaking voice. Pretty cool piece. Pretty cool piece. So, yeah, I learned learned about that artist. His stuff is super cool, and he actually had some, I think, a like a retrospective kind of recently at the uh, Smithsonian. So, uh, really interesting art. You should check them out. Bill Trailer, um, spelled T R A Y L O R, and uh, that piece was by Carlos Simon, and uh, super cool composer. So uh, let me switch back to. Thank you. Thank you. No. No. Um, I'm not. Uh, well, what we're talking about is, uh, some of y'all may know um, Ennio Morricone died this week, earlier this week, I believe. Um, really amazing, influential film composer. Uh, you know, such great hits as The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and wrote tons and tons of film scores. Um, so I was considering putting together a little tribute, but didn't get to it in time. But uh yeah, Ennio Morricone. If you if you're not familiar with his work, um, check him out. And even if you think you're not, you've probably heard tons of his stuff because it's iconic film scores. So uh, rest in peace, Ennio, and thank you for the good tunes. Um, Ecstasy of Gold. I'll play a little bit. As as y'all know, I'm. So if you've never heard that before, first of all, I'd be surprised. Secondly, if you have, it's by Ennio Morricone. And uh, sweet. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And Zach, what do you, well, I'll just throw you on here. I'll just throw you on. Throw you on the old. Interesting. Ah. So, should I repeat the whole thing? Probably. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm playing a piece by Joseph uh, Bologna, Le uh, Chevalier de Saint Georges. I cannot pronounce French very well. My apologies. Um, who is a contemporary of Mozart's back in the day? Who's actually uh, highly regarded. Uh, around the world. I think John Adams called him the most accomplished man in Europe. Um, he was a champion fencer. He swam like one of the famous French rivers with one arm tied behind his back. He was a crazy good composer and an amazing violinist. And last uh, two weeks ago, I think uh, Carl played one of his pieces. And this week, I was going to do some other stuff. I was going to accompany some short stories um, and or poetry, but all the poems and short stories at the time were really super dark and very um, um, heavy, and I just felt like I could not do them justice in a week's time. So I'll stay tuned for those those things. But in the meantime, I was like, okay, gotta 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 think of my feet, and I remembered Carl doing something by Joseph Bologna. So I looked him up, and I found this quartet for um, basically harpsichord and violin, viola, and cello. So 
what I did was I have Carl's viola still from my um, when I did Jonathan Bingham's piece two weeks ago and so or three weeks ago now already wow time flies and so I decided this was a really fun project just to play all of the accompaniment parts and then I'm playing the right hand of the harpsichord which is the main melody throughout the whole thing so that's what I'll be playing live but then you'll be hearing eight versions of me hopefully in stereo sound and uh, we'll find out so I'm gonna go over to the not zoom audio anymore and I'll ask Nick. can you hear me yes awesome so it's in two movements an allegro and then a rondo and they're both um, really just acute and hopefully a fun way to end your uh, your week it's been a stressful week for multiple multitudes of reasons and so this one's for, for all y'all to, to, to chill out this is uh, the quartet for harpsichord by Joseph Owen. Thank you. 
was movement one of the quartet for harpsichord by Joseph Belong. And I'm going to skip over to the second movement. I guess not skip over, but just continue forward. And <laughs> what you're hearing is me accompanying myself. Um, panned and hopefully eight different, eight, eight different versions of me are, are playing other instruments. And I am playing the right hand of the harpsichord. And I really enjoy putting this piece together because uh, it's pretty interesting to see, even in his piano writing, that it's very violinistic. And it sounds great as a, like a string quartet as opposed to being necessarily a harpsichord. So I'm going to continue. This is a really cute rondo. And you're going to hear clicks up front because I don't have enough technology stuff to make that not audible for y'all. So my apologies, the clicks are not by him. They're just necessary for lining up all the virtual me's. Yo, night. Nice. Nice slides, bro. <laughs> I thought you'd like. I didn't pull the Josh Dell nice, on that one. Nice slides, bro. <laughs> Dang. That, that, well that done. Was, that was a lot. <laughs> the wee, 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 wee. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, the really performance practice for Harpsichord. Nothing chords like right that, though. <laughs> <laughs> something classical well yeah like it was like 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 251 theory oh 
uh, like the like the 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 horn thing. Who wrote the piece that we studied with the horn? Oh, the back of the orchestra. Verez, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So good job. <laughs> also, Joseph. good job our teachers. So how did we remember that? <laughs> <laughs> well, because it was iconic. I don't remember anything about why we were taught that. But piece with the horn. Are you talking about? Wait, uh, a Verez piece? Verez yeah, Amariques, right? Was I it think. Uh, uh, That's a deep cut. <laughs> I mean, Maryland yeah. theory. Yet another reason why Joseph de Boulogne was ahead of his time. Yeah. Because he wrote for orchestral air horn. <laughs> and, and that was just that not. was my own interpretation. Yeah, no, I, I know, I know, I know. I would, yep. have, I would have been it's a little bit more Verez Amarique. But I, I didn't have. I had to like put this all together. I was actually very surprised that it all came together. Yeah. So quickly. Uh, you you had uh, you you were brave to take on a fast, you know, piece that's very. It, there's nowhere to hide, man. No, that's the. Uh, also, like, uh, and surprisingly, I only had to do one punch. For there was a part where the my viewpoint wow. playing was not very good, so I just had to fake it around a little bit. Oh. And, uh, yeah, so all of that is like on viola, pitched down an octave to sound like a cello. Thanks for coming, Brad. Peace. The oh, food yeah. library. Go to food li that's a that's a metalocalypse Otherwise joke from no season one, episode see. one, when they have to go to the grocery <laughs> store. <laughs> they gotta go to the grocery like, store. It's basically food food. li foods libraries, you know. But yeah, yeah so not to not to keep, but merely to borrow. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I mean, this whole life is borrowed, right? That's, that's a good too heavy that. for me. I'm hey, hungry. That's that's, the, that's that's the next stream. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're probably gonna we're we're gonna be re we're gonna keep this going, hopefully in the, roughly the same format. But it's looking like we're gonna be doing this for a while, guys. Considering everything that's Texas going on. Texas out of commission. So, not uh, doing yeah. so good. We're not going anywhere other than our houses. <laughs> so you'll probably see us again next week with more stuff to, to be had. More drizzled. More drizzles. <laughs> delectable drizzles. We'll, we'll do something else next time. I don't For know shizzle. Delectable <laughs> yeah. drizzles. Or, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how I feel about that. Anyway. Well, thank you all for coming. And <laughs> yep. again, we're giving half of all proceeds to Austin Justice Coalition. If you feel like donating, and you can also donate directly to them, their uh, thing should be in the little scroll down there. And also in the next screen that I'm going to show you once we leave, I have their website and our website, so you can donate on either of those. And thank you all for tuning in to another Invoke in Pieces, one of many. It, that have come and many more to come likely so in the meantime <laughs> check y'all later we all gonna when, once our next online stream or like online stream like once in, our, person, in person outside yeah uh, do we have one we lined up wait, yeah wait i don't think we have any planned anymore but we do True. we will have a couple we're, we're going to be doing some videos i think Oh yeah, that's right. And Jeff's yeah. dropping a, a special video soon. I'm gonna keep hounding them. Yeah. I'm on the spot. I publicly. keep on, I keep on, pestering Nick to to further edit things. So, so I, I appreciate all the work you're putting. In. Well, we gotta com we gotta complete the triangle of bothering. So Zach, get on Jeff about the. <laughs> now, <laughs> consider it completed. Now we can all just bother each other in a big circle. Anyway, In a big it's been good. It's been real. Thank you all for, for, for coming, and uh, we will check you all next week. See ya. Yep. Cheers.